Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm so excited about our lecturer today. Uh, this is our final lecture of a series that I think has been a really wonderful way for us all to come together as a school and broader community. Uh, and uh, especially during such a trying time, we've, we've had such, such a challenging year. Uh, and I find that these points of convergence, even though they're online and, and done remotely, have been a great way for us to, to listen to a series of really inspirational thought leaders, uh, shapers of, of culture and practice, uh, and uh, to have student conversations uh, with these wonderful people. And I want to thank uh, Betsy West, who's in the space with us here, uh, Emily Makash, and also uh, Greer Friedrich for doing such a remarkable job uh, coordinating this series with me. And we've had uh, uh, total, over the academic year, we've had 10 lectures and 10 uh, colloquia. So this is our, effectively our 20th uh, event to come together, a 10th lecture. And uh, <clears throat> I want to introduce in the, in the space with us today as well, Liz McCormick, who's uh, faculty in architecture and Liz has invited uh, a group of her students to join us. I understand from last semester uh, primarily, but uh, welcome students, thank you for joining us. And uh, if anyone is, is chiming in remotely for the first time, uh, this is obviously a webinar format, so we're not able to see everyone's faces, but we can see your comments in the chat. Uh, the conversation that will follow Melissa's lecture will be primarily uh, led by the students. If we have time to get to your questions, we'd certainly love to do that. Uh, and I think without further ado, I will introduce our distinguished speaker today. Uh, Melissa Farling is a principal at Gold Evans, a renowned thought leader in evidence-based design. Farling has focused her 30-year career around the impacts of architecture on people. She discovered her passion for research as a student here at UNC Charlotte and at the University of Arizona, and was able to significantly further her exploration when working on the Arizona State University Biodesign Institute, an interdisciplinary facility that has enabled world-class scientific research and revolutionary biomedicine and health outcomes. Farling was a research associate for the Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture beginning in 2006, and then became a member of the Advisory Council in 2013. She has served as a co-chair of the National AIA's Academy of, of Architecture for Justice Research Committee for a decade, co-organizing and co-leading the first criminal justice neuroscience architecture workshops. Believing that empathy and respect are the foundations for conversation and design, Farling excels at bringing multidisciplinary expertise to the studio to facilitate more informed and rigorous explorations. I'm also proud to say she's a distinguished alumna of the UNC Charlotte School of Architecture. Please join me in welcoming Melissa Farling. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so gosh, thank you so much, Blaine and Greer for, you know, for the invitation uh, to talk about such an important issue, social justice, and um, for that amazing introduction. You have quite a lineup of speakers, so I'm very humbled and honored to, to be with you all today. Um, you already gave a really great background, so I'll just do this quickly, but, um, I am a principal with Gold Heavens and we're located in Phoenix, Arizona, but we do have five offices in different parts of the country. Um, we are a multidisciplinary design firm. Again, I'm an architect with over 30 years um, experience and most of that work has been public work. Um, corrections in the beginning, courthouses, public safety, but also higher education, community and behavioral health projects. So I do have this deep passion for justice, but I consider myself more of a generalist 
And I think it's important to be able to apply what I learned from one typology to another, of course, is appropriate. Um, Blaine already said this, but I do believe deeply that what we design and build has a tremendous impact on all individuals who occupy those spaces. Um, I'm particularly interested in communities at risk and those who may be most vulnerable. And I am gonna talk a little bit about the organizations that Blaine referred to later on too. This is just a photograph or a picture of what's affectionately known as the living room of the warehouse district in South Phoenix. Um, this is the loading, old loading dock of our office. Uh, we converted this into a meeting space. The garage doors open up, they connect us directly to the community. Pre-COVID, we held many events and community workshops here. And we hope to be doing that again very, very soon. <laughs> As a discipline practice, we often collaborate with others external to our firm or studio. You know, we'll work with community nonprofits, anthropologists, ethnographers, psychologists, neuroscientists, artists, economists, geographers. There's so many things to unpack in design and the more voices and expertise um, perspectives that we can get allows us for better understanding and to get to something that's more authentic than just any one individual voice. So when thinking about this presentation today, I did a lot of soul searching. I talked to some of my colleagues in the studio. There's so much to think about regarding social justice. It, can, it really can be overwhelming. And it is difficult, but it should be. And I thought I would start with, this human, with, with human rights and the definition of social justice from the United Nations. I think it's extremely clear. And we can think of this in many different ways, you know, racial justice, climate justice, um, Healthcare, income, food insecurities. Just one second. <laughs> so I want to make clear that social justice is not just a buzzword, right? It's something that we've been working toward for a long time, but we're always challenging ourselves. How do you really walk that talk? And by no means do we have this figured out. Um, it's complex, it's nuanced, it's complicated, but only way to grow is to keep challenging ourselves and by listening. And we still have a lot of work. Um, you're probably familiar with at least some of these images. And I use them because the context and the place are so important. Um, these issues are not new, but the last year has certainly brought them into focus. So about a month ago or so, I was invited to a presentation. Um, and it was titled Co-Occurring Help and Hope for Recovery. And it was hosted by the Association for the Chronically Mentally Ill. I have, I have immediate family members who are seriously mentally ill and one has been in and out of the mental health and justice system many, many times. One of the doctors who was giving the presentation told a really powerful story I wanna share with you. Um, it's when she was a new medical resident in an emergency room. Um, and it's about an individual who came into her immune emergency room. He had multiple lacerations. He was very intoxicated. Um, she noticed that no one was looking at him. She moved him to another location. Still no one was looking at him. You know, she went up to him. She was able to calm him down and found out that he was Native American. He had been estranged from his family and he was literally brought to his knees because he couldn't stand to be in his own skin. When I said he was lacerated, he had been cutting himself. She didn't know what had happened to him after that initial encounter. But years later, she met him just again by accident, by, by just freak. And um, she didn't recognize him at first. He was in a three piece suit. Um, but after talking, she had found out he had a job, he had a girlfriend. And what he said to her was so, so important. He said, You changed my life. You were the only person who looked at me and acknowledged me. And it was at that moment that she realized that that was where the process of healing and recovery began. The doctor realized the process begins with making that fundamental and human connection with a person and acknowledging them. And you have to instill hope. The story really struck a chord with me and moved me on a lot of levels. And I think it reinforces the active impact that design can have on an individual when done correctly. So how do we think about and create and afford space where all feel welcome and heard and respected? And then how do we do this without dumbing down design too? So when I think about translating this to design, specifically the built environment and architecture, what are the feelings and emotions that run consistently through discussions? And remember feelings are something that you experience unconsciously. Emotions can be experienced consciously or subconsciously. 
And these are just a few words that come to mind that can elicit these important feelings or emotions related to social justice and design based on my experiences working with a lot of different people and organizations. My mom was a social worker. She was an assistant director for the domestic violence group in our county for many, many years. That certainly influenced me. Um, and as Blaine mentioned, it was at UNC Charlotte where I first realized I could combine my interest in psychology and so sociology and architecture by focusing on projects that had an inherent mission to create a positive impact. And this started in my third year with Eric Sada and continued in fourth year with Ken Lambla and in, into graduate school. But it was during my first year at UNC Charlotte where I had a professor who used to ask in reviews and he'd say, do you really wanna be here? And he would ask this while pointing to something specific in a model or on a drawing. Honestly though, at the time, I didn't think too much about the question. And I'm not sure that he necessarily meant it the way that I interpret it now. But it's a simple question that begs creating spaces that convey empathy and remove barriers. And I wanted to use it as a title today because it reminds me of UNC Charlotte. And I think it relates to a lot of work that I and my colleagues at least aspire to. So I have a very broad agenda because so many things overlap. So first I'll talk about some projects, then research and responsibility and some thoughts before we get to the panel discussion. And a lot of what I will share is literally focused on what could be called justice projects, right? Courthouses, land ports of entry, some corrections, but I'm also gonna discuss some other project types. And there's no way that I could get into all the details of all the projects. So instead I thought I would focus on the essential social justice issue or issues each project was designed around. And that's kind of what you see in that yellow or orange on the right, on the right to each of the project names. So the first is the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community Justice, Justice Center. Um, it's on the border of Scottsdale, Arizona. And how do we understand and determine what is important? So first, for many individuals, the American courthouse you know, is the first contact that a person has with the government, and specifically the justice system. As you can imagine, you may have experienced this. It can be a quite profound experience and be very stressful. The courthouse is also a symbol of our national democracy and historically it's the physical and civic center for community. Now, although much of this statement about the American courthouse is relevant to this project, the specific goals of this project embrace distinctly cultural preferences. In a modern time, this community's direct connection to the land has been weakened. So for the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community, justice is rooted in connection to the land and to the water. So, you know, the goals they had for the project were to include the design of contextually appropriate facility that's connected to the landscape and the culture of the tribes, you know, to represent their unique form of justice and law, which bridges tribal and Western approaches and ideologies to justice, embracing the community's sense of identity, beauty, and humanity told through the voice of humility and imperfection, and they really wanted to work with a team that had expertise and could work with the community. So, you know, we assembled a multidisciplinary team of architects, interior designers, graphic and environmental designers, um, anthropologists, ethnographer, and eventually even a photographer to help with the storytelling. So all of these images demonstrate the importance of the cultural landscape and the context. And the image right here in the center, you can see the very abrupt line right, that marks this is Scottsdale on this side, and here's the community um, on the right side of the screen. And because we hadn't worked with this community before, we, gained, we engaged an ethnographer and an anthropo anthropologist to help us recontextualize the team. Much of the history, the memory, and the experience of culture, it's just not written down. So it needed to be conveyed through storytelling and other methodologies. So we needed help not to only ask the right questions, but also to learn how to ask the questions. So to appropriately, appropriately engage the community, the process did include both quantitative and qualitative methodologies. You know, the upper left corner has a survey, very simple, you know, you've all seen surveys before, asking, do you have experience with other justice systems? But also questions like, what do you think causes most stress for those who interact with the system? Because sometimes it was easier to answer for others than for oneself. For those not comfortable, we had to gain the trust and extract our oral history through storytelling. And then in the upper right here, you see 
uh, this was research and documentation at the same time. It was a way for us to illustrate the aggregate and granularity of the data and the stories. We needed to find a way that allowed for multiple meanings of words or responses. And this uncovered new information for us. And it became important also um, to the community to, the, to maintain those details, because that way they could see that we listened and we understood. So we did a lot of research for building performance and materiality, as you do on any project. But the community's priorities included, again, water conservation, daylight, celebration of rain in the desert. So in fact, one key statement um, from the community was, modern buildings are too sterile. Do not make it perfect, because nothing is perfect. So the team conducted rigorous and methodical critical analyses you know, to determine a material that's what's inherently imperfect, what could also aggregate as a solid, but at the same time be transparent. And this led to the use of rebar that you see here. You know, we continue to work at all scales. We wanted to understand the different ways that space can afford moments for respite or connection to the land and rhythms of the day. And then in thinking about how the buildings we design continue to serve those using it, it's extremely difficult design for what is often a 50 year plus building, right? Civic buildings. They don't get built all the time. Um, this project is now several years old, but recent, so it's several years old and you wanna always try to remain relevant, even with changing context, right? Recently, one of the judge offered this comment, which was really powerful for us. You know, he said, for those of us who are actually housed in the building, it's a great exercise to walk from one end of the building to another and know that we're in the pandemic situation, but we don't have trouble with social distancing. He said, I, as a judge, have noted that there is more respect shown by defendants and respondents than in our previous building. So that was pretty powerful to us. Uh, the next project is the Mariposa Land Port of Entry. I worked on this while I was at Jones Studio. Um, I was working with my husband, who is also an architect. So this project is located on the Arizona-Mexico border in a desert, but interestingly, uh, Nogales gets more rain than the typical desert climates like we have here in Phoenix. And here you see another line, right? A border wall across the landscape. Uh, this project was part of the General Services Design Excellence Program. Um, if you're not familiar, just real briefly, the Design Excellence Program demands that design provide you know, a visual testimony to dignity, enterprise, vigor, stability of the American government, not to imitate style, and that it should be of its time. I don't know if, all, if you all know this or not, but um, recently President Biden overturned Trump's executive order on mandating traditional and classical architecture for new federal buildings, and that would have significantly changed the Design Excellence Program. That's another discussion, but just wanna make sure you knew about that. Um, this image is from Mexico, looking Northeast to the vehicular inspection areas to the left, and then to the commercial area to the right that's in blue. But what's really important about this area is that it's known as Ambos Nogales or both Nogales. You know, having for a very, very long time been one area, families lived on both sides, have been crossing the border for decades to be with their families or to work, and today, because it's divided, there's both a Nogales, Arizona, and there's a Nogales, Mexico. And now you have to go through this port of entry. So this is a poem by Alberto Rios. It's um, titled Border Lines. It was commissioned in 2003 by then Governor Janet Napol Napolitano, and it was for President Vicente Fox. It was the first time a sitting president of Mexico visited Arizona. This poem is the inspiration for the project and just you know, the point, the border is what joins us, not what separates us. This last part right here, right? So that, that, was, that was everything to the project. We knew we had to balance security and safety, you know, required with a respectful and welcoming experience for those crossing the border. The goal of security alone, you know, that's problematic. It demands a reactive response. Um, it's, it's a response just to extreme behavior. And we really wanted to consider all people's experience experiences working, um, working at or crossing the border. So, you know, we concluded that reducing the stress for the officers would have right, widespread benefits to everyone. Um, and that we could support this by prioritizing views and access to nature. And this would in turn reduce stress and improve cognitive performance. Now, 
The new configuration that you see here deviated from what had been for a long time a traditional pinwheel design. We were able to create an oasis in the center of the plan. Not only was it a safe haven for officers, but also it was a really large part of the visitor experience. We had shaded walkways, views to the oasis, and restored habitat all over the site. Here's an early photo of that oasis. Um, offices are on the right, visitor processing on the left. Um, here you can see more closely visitors in the processing experiencing an open and bright space that mitigates the sun. Here's some more views of the offices that all face the oasis and details are meant to reinforce celebration of rain when water when it is raining and water is collected. And this section brings it all together. There's a 1 million gallon water harvesting tank on this site and that irrigates all the landscape. We built in a two year contingency, but those monsoons you talked about earlier, Blaine, in the first two weeks, that tank was filled. And here I hope looks more like something that joins both Nogales on the right, that image in lieu of what had been in the past, you know, that barrier and separation, the image on the left. Next is the Maricopa County uh, South Court Tower. This is in Phoenix, Arizona. Phoenix is the fifth largest city in the country. If you were at all watching the election, you know that Maricopa County was one of those locations being closely watched. Um, at the time of the project and still today though, Maricopa County was and is actually um, a very progressive model for restorative justice, customer service and victims rights. And we assembled a critical analysis of operational approaches to justice and how this would translate to user experience and design you know, through wayfinding, daylighting, views, calm and safe areas throughout. This was the first courthouse in the nation to specifically integrate therapeutic environments for victims. Um, and the design was based on the Arizona Victims Bill of Rights. There are actually 12 rights, but maybe the most relevant to design is very simply the right to be treated with fairness, respect and dignity, free from intimidation, harassment or abuse throughout the criminal justice process. So this led to an investigation of sort of this, you know, intersection of social and human qualities as an overlay to the typical building performance metrics. Um, we wanted to focus on, again, the victim's rights, but also the jury experience and everyone's experience in the court. So how do you reduce a very stressful situation? How do you support the emphasis of trying to repair harm done? Uh, and we also worked with researchers such as Judith Hirwagen to, to, um, to conduct specific research with the victims. At the time, the living building challenge was just starting and not very well known. So we didn't really know of a framework that approached these broader social aspects of design. So we looked to other sources for, for another kind of framework for ecology and community. And we started to develop our own approach um, and wanted to look at social and human aspects, right? Placemaking, memory, dignity, empowerment, all very, very important. And here's just a few photos of the project. This is jury assembly, right? Having that orientation and context and access to views and natural light. There are victim rooms throughout at each courtroom. And that's very important for the individuals and their families. The court represents the third branch of government and there's a dignity and rigor that reflects the importance of the rule of law as the foundation of a democratic society. So we wanted to explore strategies to create a courtroom environment that supported this. And attention to dignity through details and wayfinding through art, you know, all very important. We collaborated with many. And even though there's no way that you could possibly see the not, there's all these tiny, tiny, these are all the names uh, that were involved with the project. Again, it takes many voices and perspectives to kind of inch towards any kind of change. Next, I'm gonna talk about the City of Phoenix Equitable Transit Oriented Development Planning and Community Engagement Project. City of Phoenix was awarded a federal grant to develop a community-based master plan and support local businesses along five square miles of the South Central uh, light rail extension. Gould Evans joined with Promise Arizona, a local nonprofit to lead the effort. And we were teamed up with another six or seven local organizations to develop a plan for community outreach, for business assistance and equitable transit oriented community. It's a little, um, it's not a traditional architectural project. It was important to build trust through communication and accountability. Um, the team embraced this opportunity to capture and ampl amplify community voices through many different 
many different types and customized engagement tools and strategies to reach all education levels, ages, genders, uh, race, socioeconomic demographics, because we had to build a plan that really represented all the diverse stakeholders. The key highlight here though, was the commitment to development without displacement in a community that had been marginally, that had been historically, excuse me, marginalized. And the engagement was just as much a research project as the outcomes. There was a lot of trial and error. Again, how to communicate, what to communicate was really, really critical. We developed a lot of outreach methods to reach a diverse community. You know, we had high tech digital tools. We had analog experiences. We engaged through meetings, door to door, storytelling, surveys, virtual reality, um, and physical models. This exercise down here was um, just a physical mapping exercise uh, because we wanted to understand how far residents, for instance, had to travel to the grocery, to the doctor for basic needs, things that they didn't necessarily think about or would um, necessarily bring up as, a, as, as problematic. But what we did find, for instance, is, is oftentimes they had to travel very far distances. The Maricopa County Southeast Justice Center. This was a deep dive into what represents equitable justice. Uh, the project's currently under construction. Uh, it takes four justice courts currently in strip shopping malls all over the Southeast part of the county. And it co-locates them with adult probation that's adjacent to an existing superior court. So here you just see three of those justice courts and strip malls currently. And the fourth is in a temporary location. The existing court and site is a wayfinding nightmare. Um, it's very stressful for patrons. Uh, here's a plan of the new justice court sort of just dovetailing into this is the existing superior court here. And one of the things that was sounds really simple, but it was a big deal to do was just to create a lobby where you only had one decision to make. Am I turning left to superior court? Am I going right to the justice courts? And here is a view um, from the parking lot walking south to the main lobby. And this is just facing that lobby. And it was really important to us to look to explore natural daylight as a wayfinding tool and as a material. And the strategy would help us provide cues for navigation, but would also contribute to well being. And so this is taking that sketch and translating to the actual design, right? So we have adult probation on the ground floor, and then the justice courts are above. The light wells are placed strategically. You know, we needed to, of course, balance cost and security needs. But again, the priority of equitable justice, a dignified and respectful experience and customer service are all prioritized. The open offices um, along the perimeter, they wanna exploit the views to the exterior. We're in Arizona, so we have to mitigate that sun. And you can see that faint screen here on the right. Because a screen is a large contributor to experience, we did multiple full-scale mock-ups of the screen. We wanted to test those patterns for how well the direct sun was screened um, and also ease of constructability. And then most importantly, what happens in the courtroom is often life-changing. Uh, justice courts in Arizona is where, for example, evictions occur. And you all know that this past year plus has seen staggering numbers of evictions. So through this exploration, we were hoping to create a space that's quiet, dignified, and supports justice and the decision-making that needs to happen there. The last two projects are currently on the board. Uh, the first here, um, I don't have any wonderful graphics, but the first is a secure behavioral residential, or behavioral health residential treatment facility. Uh, it's being funded through a state grant. It's a horrible name right now, but we're working on that. Uh, the state of Arizona identified a gap in care for adults who are seriously mentally ill, but keep getting caught in that healthcare and justice system for a variety of reasons. I already mentioned that, you know, my family's justice involved and I have personal experience with this and I can tell you this is needed all over the country. Um, you know, we're lucky again, the Arizona Supreme Court is revamping their pr procedures to directly help support this. And what the project will be is the residents who will live here are chronically resistant to treatment for a mental disorder. So therefore they're court ordered for treatment. The priority though, is to be able to transition the residents who'll be here for about a year to less secure living in lieu of ending up in jail or prison. 
So the grants for two 16 bed facilities, they're being operated by, or they will be operated by amazing nonprofits that we're working with. And, you know, I keep mentioning that this is a secure facility, but I wanna make it clear that they're not forensic, forensic facilities. No crime has been committed. And I stress this because there are no codes for this. So we're having to invent a lot along the way. Uh, we're just in the early stages of the project, but the focus is therapeutic, residential, and welcoming. And again, thinking about that story about that ER doctor, it needs to be a place that instills hope and supports connections to others. Another project we just begun is to develop working with the city of Phoenix and other collaborators to affect change through creative problem solving. Um, we're just doing some data gathering now, preliminary meetings. And I bring this up because often we know what needs to happen. The challenge is making it happen and who do we need to <laughs> bring together to make it happen. Um, we're very focused on social justice and a systemic approach. So designing through a lens that's holistic is really important. And we think about it again, from the first encounter with the police to alternatives and diversion to maintaining those connections with the family and community. You know, we want to think about breaking the school or the prison pipelines, and then also ways to mitigate trauma. So this is a good segue to research and responsibility. I'm gonna to have to get a little quicker, I think. Um, I'm gonna break this into some, some categories that you see here. And, you know, there comes a point where we need to just stop pulling people out of the river. We need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. And that is so important. There are many measures for building performance, but measuring impacts on our brain, behavior, well being, that's much more difficult. You know, what makes us feel a certain way, stressed, welcome, or afraid? There we go. So, you know, I did have the pure joy of co leading the first neuroscience and correctional facility design workshop many years ago. Um, you know, we discussed in our small groups the most pressing architectural issues of the time, and that's what you see here, you know, daylight, access to daylight and views, size, isolation. This ultimately led to research at the Sonoma County Jail where we measured stress levels via heart rate variability um, in correctional officers in a space without views of nature and then with views of nature. And the selection of the Savannah image artwork was based on previous research regarding evolutionary theory. And the results were significant. With the murals present, officers had faster recovery from the stress, stress of the shift, lower heart rate, lower stress levels, improved cognitive performance, less fatigue, and better attentiveness. Uh, this research also helped us explain to the Customs and Border Protection officers at the Mariposa Port of Entry project I talked about earlier, because we could explain why those connections to nature were so important to them operationally and to, to those who were crossing. We did similar uh, workshops on neuroscience and courthouse design um, back then too. I co-authored the courthouse post-occupancy evaluation toolkit. Uh, this was actually just released in December on the AIA's website. And this is relevant because we're hoping to aggregate data so we can look for patterns in the result of the user experience so that we can share it with the profession. There's been so much going on virtual in, um, in the courts that's virtual or distributed that you know, there's, there needs to be an increase in research to understand if there's any biases because testimony that's given virtually, that, you know, there's factors that may impact that, lighting, background, angles. Um, those who are vulnerable, there's different impacts. So that's something that's important for us to understand. Just touch on ethics for a second. I've always felt that the best way for, to make, for me to make change and to gain perspective is to get involved. You know, it's important for me to give back uh, when I can, and I feel like all of these efforts are connected to social justice. Uh, for several years, I've been presenting research regarding solitary confinement and why the research is important. You know, we need to do the research to help uh, change policy and impact design. And so it's just, it's just really important. There's very little direct research on individuals while, while detained in isolation because of ethics. I do wanna mention Herman Wallace. Uh, he was in solitary for over 40 years in Louisiana. I had a very tiny role in this, but I encourage you to see the film if you're interested. And I wanna stress that he was in solitary for over 40 years. To make the next point, I don't expect you to read all of this. Huda Akil is a neuroscientist at University of Michigan. She studies isolation. 
Uh, some of what is highlighted here are just some of the de deleterious effects. But notice the last sentence. Ethical guidelines forbid researchers from keeping animals in social, isol social isolation for long periods of time. There's no question that we do better by our mice and rats, especially when you think about individuals that have been in for 40 years. And there's someone here at the state hospital, I'm on the independent oversight committee, who has been in um, administrative separation for eight months, over eight months. So just how many of you know that the AIA has a professional code of ethics? You don't have to answer that, but this code highlights research in upholding human rights, dignity, and health. This, however, um, is from 2018. Just this December, our code of ethics was updated to include rules prohibiting knowingly designing spaces for execution or for torture, including indefinite or prolonged solitary confinement. Um, I was part of these discussions um, as, part of, as part of the leadership group of the AIA's justice group. I was also a representative from the justice group to present research uh, to the National Ethics Council uh, two other times regarding these issues in the past. It's a very complicated issue. The text um, here has commentary, but also there's more follow-up because we also feel it's important to be part of the solution. I will say though, this kind of statement is powerful and we're using this in our discussions regarding administrative separation in the behavioral health uh, hospital si situation I just commented on. Um, it's really hard for people to imagine alternatives, but we as architects and designers are good at that. <laughs> Um, 10 years ago, the AIA Justice Group re created this Green Guide to Justice, and it's really an effort about going beyond sustainable strategies that are building focus. Okay, it was a white paper looking at those broader issues, and it was a vision for what justice architecture should look like in 2030. Um, it included a lot of different strategies, including you know, where, where facilities should be located and creating normative environments. But so much has changed in the past 10 years. And then thinking about the context that we're in now, uh, we had to update this. So we did this this year for Vision to 2040 and with much more focus on gender responsive design, racial and ethnic disparities, mental health and a continuum of care. Again, looking at the entire system, including recovery, reentry, and alternatives. Another really important publication is by the International Committee of the Red Cross. It's called Towards Humane Prisons, and you can get this online. Um, I was honored to serve as one of the reviewers. One of the editors, Rich Wenner, um, who's one of my mentors actually, his comment is, for those who were placed in prisons or jails, we need to remember that loss of liberty or imprisonment is done as punishment, not for punishment. And we need to, to design with that in mind. Um, supporting uh, the ICRC is, are these United Nations minimum rules for treatment of prisoners. You might have seen this before and heard them referenced as the Mandela rules. And it really focuses on treating people with dignity and valuing them as human beings, right? It also supports um, what the AIA code of ethics um, changed just recently, right? According to these rules, 15 days or more is torture in solitary confinement. So think about that again, when you think about the 40 years or eight months. Uh, the guidelines are built on four very simple principles that you see here, right? Do no harm. That's pretty easy. The rest are self-explanatory. But the fact that design can mitigate four of the most common causes of harm, to me, that's a really powerful statement and gives us a lot of responsibility. Three years ago, I chaired um, the Academy of Architecture for Justice annual conference. Um, I was lucky to work with an amazing committee. The focus there was on mental health and the crisis that we have. Um, in our country. The National Alliance of Mental Health estimates more than 2 million arrests involve people with serious mental illnesses. And today, the jails in Los Angeles, New York, and Chicago are the number one mental health providers in our country. So this was the first time for us, at least as architects, uh, justice architects, we brought in the health architects too, to join us to tackle this issue and focus on long-term systemic solutions. Because to change, we can't continue to talk to ourselves about mental health in the justice system. We have to look to solutions that are outside our typologies. Um, and then next I'll just touch on education. Mentoring and teaching is so important. And I've also been really excited to be participating in reviews um, here at UNC Charlotte. 
Uh, last spring, uh, I co-led a fourth year studio at Arizona State University. And it was, the focus was very much on what it means to be in service of when, with regard to public work. And we had a series of questions that overlaid the process relating to context and the role of the architect. And we laid out a variety of assignments that built upon each other and situated the students in context that they weren't used to. And we did this intentionally because we wanted to help them see and think from different perspectives and not preconceive a solution. So for example, they were very uncomfortable to not have a, pres a prescribed program. Um, we brought in lecturers. They were from architecture, social sciences, school of sustainability, film, dance, and theater, ethnics, eth and ethnography. Um, we talked about publicness, not taking things for face value. You know, context is not automatic. It's something that we actually construct. New methods of data collecting and pedagogy. And again, all of this was an attempt to create future citizen architects. So just some thoughts before we get into discussion. Um, I hope, I don't know if you all saw this because it's just happened this morning. Uh, the National Organization of Minority Architects, right, just posted uh, and released a statement in response to the guilty verdict of the man who murdered George, George Floyd. So I encourage you all to visit the website and read for yourself. It's very powerful, but it also underscores all of the work that's, you know, still left to do. And then, you know, I sh I'm sure you've all thought about this, especially if you're practicing, but when, when do you engage in a project, right? There's a lot of projects that are really hard. Um, I relate to this quote by Michael Murphy from Mass Design Group, and I also highly recommend their book, Justice is Beauty. Um, this is something in our office that we're constantly discussing, when to engage, when can we make a difference? We do think it's our responsibility to participate. Uh, there are projects we've said no to, I've left, jobs before because of work I didn't feel I could do in good conscience, but absolutely we need to participate in the conversation. If a client is trying to change, some, change something and they're willing to go there, we wanna work with them. Um, and we need to remember we have a role to play as this quote says. And there are a lot of efforts changing paradigms now. There's the decommissioning of Rikers Island, there's Hope House in the Bronx, there's work by the Vera Institute, Diana Van Buren and Designing Justice, Designing Spaces, um, Architects, Designers, and Planners for Social Responsibility. There's the Red, uh, Red Hook Community Justice Center up at the top. There's so much happening right now. So as you continue to create spaces for people, just, you know, there's so much to think about, but, you know, break down those silos. Remember that change is hard and doing right can be hard. Learn from mistakes please consider intent versus the actual impact. Listen and continue to dialogue and please don't, under, don't underestimate empathy or beauty. Thank you. I know I went kind of long, so I apologize. Well, that was great, Melissa. Thank you so much. Um, what a profound and timely set of issues and, and topics uh, and, and very inspirational. I'll uh, pass it off to Liz to moderate uh, the student discussion. Yeah, that was great. And, and, and I will immediately pass it off to the students. <laughs> um, so Alex, why don't you kick us off? Thank you, Melissa, for your um, sh sharing with us your work and your knowledge. Um, and so my question is, I'm just kind of curious uh, about how sort of besides making these beautiful correctional and government buildings more comfortable for users um, if you feel that there's a certain responsibility for architects that needs to start to question more of the underlying um, carceral logics especially you know with emerging the emerging business of like private prisons and you know push instead to design systems of restorative justice and rehabilitation and treatment things like this yeah, thanks, Alex. That's a, that's a great question. Um, just one thing I want to clarify, private prisons are only about, oh, I'm going to, I don't know if it's exactly right. It's, it's seven or 8%, I think, of all, of all prisons that we have in the country. And I only make that distinction because they're not the problem necessarily. I am not in any, me in any way advocating for private. There's a lot of other issues with that. <laughs> um, but yeah, if I, 
so if I understand your question correctly, um, I was trying to give the example, for instance, of, of the research that we've been doing on correctional facilities and, and, and specifically, let's take solitary confinement. Um, because the built environment, the spaces do create quite an impact, right? Negative, negative outcomes, right? So I think it's important for us to not only um, try to quantify those, because it seems we need to, um, so that we can change policy and make these impacts. And I think it's um, incredibly important for the architectural pr profession to um, lead a lot of these conversations when we can, you know? Um, and the only way to do, so, so oh, there's so much connected to that. That's why I think it's so important to get involved. I mean, I think the only way that we're ever gonna make significant change, you know, is, is to get involved. Um, I think about Harvey Gant when I was a student, right? Harvey Gant was mayor. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know, Alex, if, if, and you talked about restorative justice too. So am I, am I closing in on your question or do you want to follow up? Yeah, um, I'm just wondering if you see that sort of in the discipline, more of a push towards a systemic change, or is it just about making these spaces, you know, prettier and more comfortable? No, no way. I mean, it's got to be systemic. Yeah making a pretty yeah that's that's where i'm saying for instance it's a problem when someone with a you know is picked up from the police and ends up in jail and then in the system because they're not you know they have a mental health issue and they're not getting treatment what good is that to anybody right so um no it's a lot of conversation so we have like these conferences it's great because um that's where we can have some of those dialogues but there's so much work to do Thank you. Thanks. And you, you made a comment that I wrote down that said, uh, design can mitigate the most common causes of harm, which I think leads into Aiden's question about uh, school design. Hi there, thank you again for your, your talk today. It's been very informative. Uh, my question uh, needs a bit of context. So to start, uh, Freeport High School in Michigan by Tower Pinkster, who also designs prisons, is built to be shooter resistant by security experts. Entryway described as an educational panopticon, notoriously a, a prison design. The curved hallways reduce sight lines and are peppered with bulletproof concrete wings. Every dorm window is meant to buy time for authorities to arrive. Conversely, Sandy Hook's redesigners, Spiegel and Partners, have expertise in education and research spaces and heavily relied on community input to minimize the impact of security oriented design had on the perception of the school. Every opening of the school is impact resistant still, the playful river is still a moat, every reading cubby designed like tree houses and still affords secure hiding spaces and the curved plan uses structural elements to reduce sight lines in a playful manner. So with your research in prison psychology in mind, what might the impact on America's youth be in shooter oriented school designs like Fruitport High versus the more empathetic strategies Sandy Hook employs? Thanks, Aiden, that's a, yeah, that's a powerful comparison. Um, so without having seen either of the, those projects, although I can imagine by your description, it doesn't take, <laughs> I don't have to make a, a big leap there. Um, I know, I mean, I think it's always going to be an issue. It sounds like, is it Free, Freeport? That's the one that's- uh, Fruitport. I'm sorry? Fruitport, like the, uh, oh. like an apple. Okay, Fruitport, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, if I understood what you were saying correctly, it sounds like perhaps that is not a very welcoming. That's, that's my suggestion, yes. It's not a very welcoming facility, right? Um, you know, it's interesting. So the AIA actually, after the shootings happened, the AIA um, Group on Education, I'm sorry, I can't remember what their knowledge community is called, um, issued a Where We Stand, right, to, um, again, take a stand on saying we don't have to design um, fortresses. You know, there's different ways to have community engagement and respond and design something appropriate. Um, also something here, um, I worked with Marlene Amerzian, another architect here in Phoenix, um, with the governor's office to do a school primer on things to think about from design and um, to try to avoid, you know, some of what you described. Um, I think that um, looking at, at design holistically, right, um, 
and working with the community, there are certainly, certainly ways to create supportive environments. Again, it's hard for me to comment specifically because I, I, you know, on the spaces. Um, but I will say it's very hard for, for individuals to learn, right, if they don't, if they don't feel safe, um, but if they don't feel welcomed, I mean, you have to balance all that. You have to balance what it means to be comfortable, right? Um, and what it means to, um, to be safe. Also, you have to balance things that, you know, there's a lot of research from the past on um, having those views to nature and natural daylight and how that impacts how that impacts learning. Um, and then you also have to talk about the faculty that's there and the staff that's there, right? Um, what specifically are, because that's quite, like I said, that's quite a comparison. What would you like me to focus this answer on or response on? Um, well, I'm really curious about the, well, if we design a school with you know, school shooters specifically in mind, first and foremost, uh, in my mind, a person who has not researched prison psychology, that would make me think that students would anticipate a school shooter. Right. Um, and this, but it's an interesting question because at the same time, we design our schools for fire safety, but we don't anticipate a fire, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess it's really a question of you know, how much can we design with these things ahead of time? And then how much can, for example, Sandy Hook's design, can it be hidden away? Um, so yeah, just the sort of the impact on, on what mm -hmm. a, a human would experience. Yeah, I mean, so the one thing I can think to relate to that is, and, and there's research on this um, with, with prison facilities, it's sort of like the harder you build something, um, the more people re will react to it in a sort of hard way. Right, so I can imagine that. Um, it's also so, uh, potentially a space that you may not feel pride or you might not feel respected in. Uh, but then also, I mean, I always question this because we all worry about this. I have children, you know, I have a daughter, but you know, that's a boundary. How far out do you take the boundaries, right? So do we want to live in a world where it's just, you know, we're just constantly in something that's protective going from A to B? Or do we figure out something that's um, a different kind of solution like you described with the Sandy Hook? Thank you very much. Great, thank you. And I think that's a, a great, great question. Aiden sent me the, the question or, you know- It's a hard one, it's a good a, one. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a, a terrifying question to be thinking of, but it's, it's a, a reality that we, we live in at this point. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Patty, why don't you go ahead? Um, hi, Melissa. I wanted to thank you so much for being here to discuss um, all these important issues. Um, I'd like to know uh, what role does urban architecture play in peaceful protests, and how do you respond to the destruction of buildings when protests take a more violent turn? I'm just writing. Okay, thanks, Patty. Those are those are really good too. So that's really interesting. Um, Recently, oh, recently the city of Tempe, and that's where I live, and Tempe is just outside of Phoenix, okay? It's just right next to Phoenix, Arizona, um, had issued a um, RFQ for a, 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 basically a youth failure analysis, right? And I looked at all the different um, issues being discussed, and I contacted, um, I contacted the city, Actually, I sent them a pretty long email asking them why um, the built environment was not at all included anywhere in looking at the failure analysis. Um, and, and specifically, right, just the, the design, even you know, the urban design, the urban planning of the city um, is really interesting. From that, we had a lot of great conversations. I'm now on the um, Human Relations Commission. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, advi which advises the mayor and the council, right, um, to ensure that, that everything that's done is equitable. Um, so that's 
kind of interesting. Um, but I, I absolutely agree that all of, without a doubt, um, social justice, equity, all of these issues um, need to be embedded, right, in, in the planning of our, of our communities. And um, creating space, right? I, you know, I showed the, those images um, at the beginning of Portland and New York. Um, you know, having areas absolutely where you can have peaceful protests is part of what we need to make sure um, that, you know, we help design, we enable, um, we have to have people, you know, it's important that people feel welcome. There was a big difference, obviously, between January 6th, right, and what happened there and what happened in other locations all over the country. And of course, even before January 6th, I forget the exact statistic, but something like, you know, all we see on the news, you know, 7% is, is the violence, but there's the 93% that's peaceful, right? You don't see that. Um, but I think it's, it's incredibly important that we create those spaces. So when we have opportunities on any kind of building, we're, so I don't even think it has to be a civic building, but if you're doing anything that is in, you know, that could have any kind of civic or public space, or, or if it's adjacent to something and you have an in-between space, right? How we, um, how we develop our streets, something we talk about here a lot, and I don't know if I'm answering your question either, but, um, a lot of times there are plans that are created, but it will leave out important things like infrastructure. Like, okay, it's great for us to provide a bus stop there with shade, but guess what? We don't have any water. So if we wanna have a tree there, it's gonna be really difficult to be able to, you know, maintain that tree without any water anywhere near there. I mean, that's just a silly example, but infrastructure is a huge deal in, in some of these solutions too. Um, so again, I think, you know, you're asking how to respond. Um, you know, again, it's just getting as many people together as possible because none of these, none of these, none of these problems are simple problems, right? Um, like here in Tempe, it would take, you know, it takes like parks and recs. It takes the city planners, it takes the mayor's office, right? Then it takes designers um, to all get involved to, to, to try to make these kinds of changes. Thank you. Thanks. Great. So uh, Melissa, we want to shift gears a little bit and ask mm -hmm. a bit about your, your, your role as a researcher and a designer mm -hmm. and, and a practitioner. So uh, Sarah. Yeah, so I thought it was interesting that you thought of yourself as a generalist or how you referred to it at the beginning of the lecture. Mm -hmm. And given your personal interest in the field of psychology and architecture in your academic years, I was, cur I was curious to know how you maintained this uh, multidisciplinary approach in your professional career. And by doing so, who do you most commonly find yourself working with in order to achieve successful equitable design? Great question too. So um, I'm, I don't, I love work. So um, I have another, <laughs> I have another um, presentation I've, I've given in the past. It's called work, school, and play. And um, so work is obvious. Work is the work I do with Gold Evans, right? Um, uh, school was anything, um, my different interactions with the universities. Um, and that type of research. And then play is what I call research, but that's also all of my sort of volunteer time, right? So it's any of my pen, I call it is play, it's, well, it's, it's I choose this, so how can it not be, right? But it's, it's, it's where my passion lies, um, is in the research. So very specifically, um, you know, I continue with the justice group and their research group because it's a, it's a network of amazing national expertise, right? Um, so I learned so much from that. And, you know, we get together and work on pro projects together. Um, same, you know, Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture, uh, similarly. 
but then also with the universities. So I find where I get to do the research, and again, you know, redirect me if I'm not getting here, but, you know, research could happen through a project, it could happen through a grant, it could happen through one of the organizations that I'm working with. Um, you know, it happens in all those different ways. And, and I've been for many years, up until I will say the last year and a half or so, most of my work was more national at a national level. And I am trying to do more now locally because that was the, always the intent, like, right? To make an impact, I wanna make an impact everywhere, but it's really also important to me to bring it home. <laughs> And do that here and so that's why you know i just quickly touched on a couple of the committees here the tempe human relations committee or the arizona state hospital independent oversight committee which you know ensures that um, human rights are being upheld those are really really important to me um and so yeah i mean there's a lot that's done i don't know if you're asking, a lot that's done certainly in my free time but again, I consider it uh, important and I consider it, um, you know, play. I consider it fun. Yeah. Thank you. Great. And, and to all the participants, please feel free to type any questions in the chat and we can, we can read those out loud. Um, but Christina has, I think, the question. So why don't you, why wow. don't you do it? <laughs> Um, so throughout your time in the profession, have you seen a rise in people more interested in designing dignified and safe spaces for all? And is it difficult to get colleagues and clients to care about the humanity of a project, especially when it comes to controversial works like prisons and jails? And if so, how do you ensure that a project still takes humanity and dignity into consideration when it's not of particular interest to the client? Okay, more great questions. So um, <laughs> I think, have I seen a rise? I would say that's a hard question because there might be a rise in that. I mean, I think it's certainly talked about more. I think people understand. Um, the more and more people I talk to, and I'm not just talking about people in design community, right? Any, any, anyone. Um, understands the impacts um, on health and well being. I think, if anything, this past year with everybody having to be inside, people are acutely aware of how much space, right, impacts them. Um, so I think there's a rise in awareness. <laughs> um, I don't know if there's a rise in. I think that's very hard to say whether or not there's a rise in more in more design that is responding in a dignified way, right? Because I bet for every project that I think is amazing, I could, you know, there's, there's another one that's less amazing, right? <laughs> um, but I do think awareness is, has absolutely increased. Uh, I guess if I was more optimistic, and I do like to be optimistic, there, you know, maybe there's a rise. And then you talk about clients, and um, so when I was talking about when, to, when, how you decide when to when to engage, right? I think um, there are many clients out there who understand and who want to. Um, provide spaces that are dignified, right? But, you know, we have 50 states, Puerto Rico, et cetera, right? We're, we're, we're a country of many, many, many different jurisdictions, right? We have federal, we have state, we have county, we have municipal. And I will say that each jurisdiction um, probably has its own philosophy and ideology. So, um, so a lot of times it depends, you know, specifically on the client. Um, I think that's changing a lot more. I think this past year has forced a lot of change, um, which is very positive, um, although it's taken too long. Um, 
I think you have to know when you can make a change and when you can't, I will always respect someone who goes in and tries to make a change. But I will say if, for instance, there's a, a request for, for qualifications for a, um, let's say a 500 bed super max facility, right? That program's not necessarily lending itself to you know, those kind of dignified spaces. Um, that, and I'm not saying it's not worth trying to go in and change that. I'm just saying it could be very difficult to change something like that, right? Um, but that is why I think it's important, again, to, to present everywhere, to get involved, you know, to spread the word, talk about these issues. Um, I am all, you know, all the time, I'm always surprised that people are like, oh, I never thought about it like that. They just, you know, people don't think about these things a lot. So, you know, that kind of awareness is so important. Yeah, and I think a part of that is just, you know, what, what if it affects the financial implications of the project and, and, and how do you value social issues versus financial issues, which, which appear very clearly on a, on a spreadsheet? whereas the social issues don't. Right, yeah, no, that, I mean, and, and we, struggle, we struggle with that all the time, but that's just part of, that's just, you know, that's just part of the problem solving. Sure. It just has to be. And we had a, we had a question come in on the chat from one of, uh, one of your colleagues in the Distinguished Alumni Club, Melanie Redrick, who asks, what effect does 40 years of solitary confinement have on a person mentally, physically, emotionally? Yeah, there are I, all bad. Um, <laughs> that's like the summary is all bad. There, I mean, you know, there's uh, Craig Haney, Stuart Grassian, Terry Coopers, uh, Huda Akil, who I just mentioned, have all testified. Um, well, Huda might not have, but the other three have, um, you know, testified before Congress specifically on those negative outcomes, right? Mentally, physically, emotionally. Um, it's it's profound, um, and forty years certainly has a tremendous impact. But the interesting thing is, as the United Nations and the Mandela Rules say, um, and actually Craig Haney goes on to talk about this too, that th you can have almost as significant impacts fifteen days in or more as you could forty years. So. You know, that's still to be understood because I think I mentioned that, you know, we haven't been able to do the kind of research we would like to on individuals while they're in solitary confinement. Um, but that's a problem. And that's why part of the code of ethics was revised too. Yeah, and it's, it's just, you know, reinforces how much of a role design can have on, on, on a, a human, on a community as well. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for that. And I'm, I'm going to pass it back to uh, Blaine to close us out. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. You've given us so much to think about and uh, such fundamental issues that affect us all. Uh, questions of human dignity and justice, uh, questions of mental health and uh, isolation. Um, and, and also with, with just with deep admiration and appreciation for how you're fighting for voices that can't be heard often. Um, so I'll be pondering this one for a long time. <laughs> I just wanna appreciate uh, how you have shattered any kind of myth that uh, architecture is just a kind of passive or reactive service, right? A kind of content agnostic service. We're just waiting for the next project to come in the door and we just work on that. I mean, uh, this is something I hope all students especially will remember uh, that uh, what a great example to, to make significant transformative change. And uh, Melissa, as, as uh, a new member of your uh, former home, just want to welcome you to, you know, if there's any way that we can help you in, in this wonderful cause, uh, please consider this a larger community of partners. So 
Thank you so much. No, oh, no, thank you so much. And thank you all for amazing, thoughtful questions that I don't have the answers to all of, but um, <laughs> I really appreciate how um, challenging um, your thoughts and your questions were. And so thank you so much.